Dr. Luke has been weaving together the stories of these two remarkable baby boys, John and Jesus, in the opening chapters of his book. They, these boys born six months apart that will be integral to the saving work of redemption that God is bringing into the world. And you have these both boys, there's so many parallels, both are announced angelically, both are through miraculous pregnancies brought into the world, both are given special non-family names, uh, both are born, born with divine destiny upon their lives. And even from the very beginning, you can feel it, the anticipation building. Remember what the neighbors of Zechariah and Elizabeth said when John was born. They whispered to one another in chapter 1, verse 66, what then will this child be? Remember how the townsfolk went around in wonderment as the shepherds told them about the baby king born in a manger in Bethlehem 2, 18. Luke tells us all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And then, of course, Simeon saw Jesus coming into the temple when he's just 40 days old, recognizes him, and says, this is God's salvation that will bring light to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel, in chapter 2, verse 32. Oh, the people knew God is on the move. And somehow these two boys will be central to the saving work of God as it breaks in to the world. And then all of a sudden it goes quiet, <laughs> fairly quiet, as these little boys have some growing up to do. And fast forward 30 years, 30 years, and we come to Luke chapter 3. 30 years distance, as these two boys have now become men and are about to step out onto the world stage, and the planet and all of history will never be the same. The last we heard of John was in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, where Luke summarized for us these words, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. He was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. And now today we're going to see that moment, that public appearance as John steps into the fullness of his ministry and prepares the way of the Lord. He is a voice crying in the wilderness. So grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke chapter 3. We're going to look at the first 20 verses today, and you'll find today's reading on page 858 to 59 in the Pew Bible, 858 to 59. Again, Luke chapter 3. I'll begin reading here in verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, te tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to him to be baptized, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that, does therefore not, that therefore does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? 
And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also came to him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort, extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Thanks be to the Lord for the reading of his word. Did, did you notice how carefully Dr. Luke is in doing his research here? He's located these events within their broader geo, geopolitical movement. Uh, in this moment, he, he gives us a list of contemporary political and religious figures so we can seat this in a specific time and place. Historians know exactly when and where these events happened. The year is AD 29. And John is located in the Judean wilderness that lies east of Jerusalem and south of Jericho, where the Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea. And John here is considered the very last of the Old Testament prophets. Verse 2 uses a prophetic formula when it says, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah. It is very clear that John is speaking to the people on behalf of of God, just like the prophets of old in the Old Testament. But in many ways, John's ministry here is unique. He's the very last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the forerunner of Messiah. He's preparing the way of Jesus. And so his assignment is unique. His ministry is unique. And his call is unique. And you can see it all throughout the passage. His call is one of repentance repentance. And so what I want to show you this morning is three things, the why of repentance, the what of repentance, and the how of repentance. The, what, the why, the what, and the how of repentance. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray together as we dive into God's Word. Father, repentance is something we usually flee when people point out our faults or our sins, we get defensive, we get, uh, we bristle. And so, Father, would you, by your mercy and grace, send your Holy Spirit to override our natural instincts this morning. Help us to hear, to receive, to be open to what you want to do in our hearts. We expect we'll be convicted, and that's okay because that only presses us deeper into your mercy and grace. And so, Father, help us be non-defensive to welcome your rebuke because it comes in love. And so we give you ourselves. We hold nothing back. Come teach us, make us new, transform us, we pray. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. So first of all, the why of repentance. The why of repentance. If you're to summarize John's message in a single word, it's Repent, repent. Look at verse 3. He went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, in English, the wor our word repent means something akin to sorrow or remorse or regret. It's more of an emo emotional word for us. But in Greek, repentance is more along the line of rethinking everything about your life. Rethinking. It has a little more of a cognitive orientation. In Hebrew, repent means to turn around, to, to do a U-turn, to head in an entirely new life direction. It's like your GPS tells you or tells me whenever I'm going the wrong way, even though U-turns are illegal in Chicago, it always tells me, make a U-turn at the next available opportunity, right? 
Repentance is a call to rethink your life direction. It is a call to turn around and to head in a whole new path. John is proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He's saying, the Lord is coming, folks. His salvation is at hand, and you're not ready. You're not prepared. Your hearts are all jumbled up and twisted by sin, and if God shows up now as your hearts are, you're going to miss Him. You're going to miss Him. And so I'm calling you to repent, to get right with the Lord now, today, so that when He does come, you'll be ready. And you'll be ready to receive Him and receive the salvation that He brings. After all, John is, as quoted in Isaiah, hear the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill made low, and every crooked thing shall be make, become straight. The rough places shall be leveled, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. This prophetic quotation here is from Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. And we see here the forerunner's assignment to go ahead of the Lord as an advanced party to make way for his arrival. And there's all this imagery here of rearranging topography, right? Removing obstacles, barriers, paving a way through the desert and the mountains for the Lord's reception to be smooth and welcoming. And of course, John's ministry is not as a road worker. He's not blasting a highway tunnel through the mountainside. No, his job is to deal with the hardness of the human heart. Because until our hearts are softened, we are not prepared to receive God's saving work. Friends, there's all kinds of obstacles and barriers in our hearts that get in the way of what God wants to do in us. I'm talking about stubbornness and pride and defensiveness and excuse-making and blame-shifting and self-justification. These things, they stand like mountains in the way of God's saving work, the work that God wants to bring into our lives to free us and heal us and redeem us and save us. We throw these mountains in His path. And it stands in the way of who we want to be as well. Think about it. Who do you want to be? You want to be deep down like Jesus, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And it is the stubbornness of our own hearts that stands in the way of the people we want to become. We are our own worst enemies. And John's assignment here is to prepare the way to blast through those boulders of stubbornness in our hearts, to straighten out the crookedness of our pride, to fill in the gaps of our excuse-making, to bring down mountains of blame-shifting, to scrape away the rubble of our own self-justification. So John cries out, repent, repent, rethink your whole way of living. Stop your sinning. Admit that you're in the wrong. Turn around. Get right with God. It's time to go in a whole new life direction. That's what this act of baptism is all about. The old life being washed away, dead, buried, and gone, and a new life awaiting, a fresh start, clean, humble, contrite, ready, willing, hungry, receptive, yearning for the coming of the Lord, for His presence and His salvation. The problem, friends, if we're honest, is that repentance is really hard for us. We don't like facing our shortcomings. We don't like dealing with our failures. We don't like the waves of shame and guilt that arise when we find out we're in the wrong. We try to do almost anything to avoid the pain of confession and contrition. Repentance feels bad. And so we have a tendency to screen out anyone who calls us to repentance because it sounds like such bad news, doesn't it? 
But look, it's interesting. Look down in verse 18 with me. This is what Luke says. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Good news. So if you're going to describe repentance, Luke says, is this good news? Now, John has some pretty harsh words for these people. He calls them a brood of vipers in verse 7. But this is a call to repentance, and repentance is good news, friends, because repentance feels like death, but it is the only way to life. Repentance feels like death, but it is the only way to life. Repentance, friends, is the gateway through which God's salvation arrives. When we confess our sins, we find mercy. When we repent of our ways, we find grace to lead us in a whole new path in life. When we lose ourselves, we actually get ourselves back. When we die, we come to life. Repentance might feel like death, friends, but it is the only way to live. The great danger of our souls is that we'll resist repentance and in doing so miss out on the salvation of God. By avoiding repentance, we cut ourselves off from the life and mercy that God wants to pour into us. Holding on to our pride is only going to lead to our ruin. For God gives grace to the humble, and it is His kindness that leads us to repentance. Repentance is our friend. Repentance is our friend. That's the why of repentance. God wants to bring salvation and grace and healing into our lives, but our sinful hearts, our prideful hearts aren't ready for it. They're not prepared. There's too much stubbornness, too much ego, too much willful selfishness in the way. And we need a humbling, an emptying, a dying of repentance to make us tender to the mercies of God, to make us receptive to His grace so that we can openly receive the presence and salvation of the Lord. That's what we need. That's the why. Now, the what of repentance. What is this repentance that John is calling us to? If the essence of repentance is making this kind of U-turn in life, what is it that John is calling these people and us from? Well, there are four life patterns that John is going to identify here. Pay attention. Number one, he's calling us to repent of cultural religiosity. Cultural religiosity. Look at verses uh, 7 down to 9. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid at the foot of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, this is pretty hard, isn't it? Why, did, why does John come at them so hard here, you know? You brood of vipers. You nest of snakes, right? Well, he's trying to rattle their cage, isn't he? He's trying to shake them up. Uh, he says, don't you dare think that your religious heritage as Jewish people will make up for a lack of God, love for God in your own hearts. Don't you dare think that. Being a descendant of Abraham, gen Abraham genetically isn't enough. You need a personal relationship with the living God. You need real faith in your own heart. See, in John's, days, Jay, John's day, like ours, people hid behind their religious cultural heritage, and they failed to love God for themselves. And John's saying, look, you might be from a good religious family, but God doesn't have any grandkids, only children. 
And unless you have a personal relationship with God that is genuine and heartfelt, none of that religious heritage matters. John says you're going to need to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Get right with God yourself and then prove it by the way you act. Let your heartfelt repentance and faith toward God show up in the way that you live. Because when the Lord shows up, he's going to separate those who truly know him and are bearing good fruit from those who are fruitlessly just going along with the religious cultural flow and don't know him at all. He says, repent of all that cultural religiosity. It's time you got right with God. You get right with God. The second life pattern that John calls us to repent from is disin, uh, disin, disintegrated, I'll get it right, is, <laughs> it's disintegrated faith, disintegrated faith. Remember in verse 8, John said, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. In other words, when we get right with God, it always changes how we live, somehow. But what kind of fruit does John have in mind here? Look at verses 10 down to 14. And the crowds ask him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said, collect no more than you're authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, don't extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. This, this is fascinating, isn't it? John is preaching repentance, which is all about getting right with God, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, yes? That's what repentance is about. But then the fruits of repentance that he identifies here are all about acting rightly toward our fellow man, about loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. So repentance, you see, is about getting right with God, but the fruits of repentance are about living rightly with one another. In other words, when the, when the roots of our faith are right, when in repentance and faith, we root down deeply into God's forgiveness and grace and mercy, then the fruits that are born on the tree of our lives that necessarily and naturally flow from that root system is a life of generosity, fairness, respect, honesty, and honor toward our fellow man. Loving God rightly means loving others rightly as well. You can't disintegrate your love for God from your treatment of other people. To love God means loving other people. You see the connections. This is really important. So he's saying, if you see your neighbor is naked and you realize that God clothed you in your state of sinful nakedness before him, that God clothed you with his own righteousness by his mercy and grace, then you cannot help but be generous and give them the extra tunic that you have in your closet. Do you see that? The connection between the gospel transformation that God is doing and the way it issues in your behavior and life. He says, if you're tempted to inflate your fees and line your own pockets, and yet you remember the generous self-giving love of the Lord your God who saved you when you were penniless spiritually before him, you, you, can't, you can't selfishly take advantage of your fellow men, see? You, no, you got to be fair and honest, generous toward others because of the generosity of God toward you. It's only right. It's only right. It's only fitting. You see that? If you're an officer of the law 
Sure, you can throw your weight around and try to, you know, pull somebody over and get a bribe to get you off because you've got the authority. Everybody's doing it. And he says, but if you've been saved by a God who used his authority not to abuse you, but to serve you and give himself to you in self-sacrificial love, then you see, you can't abuse your power. You can't do it. You can't use power for your own ends. You've got to honor and serve others. It's only right and fitting. You see how the gospel shapes our souls in such a way that it issues in changed behavior. 1 John 4, verse 20 says, if anyone says, I love God and yet hates his brother, he's lying. We can't be right with God if we're wrong toward others. <laughs> loving God rightly means loving others rightly. Love God, love people. It's an integrity. It's integrated. It's one. Integrity comes from the word integer, like from math, whole numbers. It means wholeness. It means unity together, oneness. Love God, love people, integrated faith. John says, repent of all that disintegrated faith. It's time you got right with others. It's time you got right with others. The third life pattern that John calls them to, calls us to turn away from, is hypocritical fakery. Hypocritical fakery. Verses 15 to 17. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water. But he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn and the chaff. He will burn with unquenchable fire. John says, look, I'm, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the anointed one. I'm just the warm-up act. <laughs> The real deal is coming, the mighty one, and I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie his sandals and wash his feet at the end of the day. No, I'm not even worthy to be his slave. When he shows up, he'll baptize you not with water like me to wash you on the outside. No, he'll baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire and it'll go right down and cleanse your souls. This language is evocative of Malachi chapter three, verses two and three, where the Lord's coming is prophesied to be like a fuller's soap and a refiner's fire. It's like a soap that will purge the stain and cleanse the cloth. It'll burn away the, the dross like fire. It will purify the gold. He uses another image here of a winnowing fork in his hand that will destroy the chaff and gather in the wheat. In each of these images, the fuller's soap, the refiner's fire, the winnower's fork, in all of them, they're playing on the same idea that the Lord is separating out the valuable, the genuine, from what is worthless and false. It may be hard to tell where the stain ends and the color of the cloth begins, but the fuller's soap will launder it out. It may be difficult to know where the dross is disguised within the genuine gold, but the refiner's fire will purify and purge it away. The chaff and the wheat might be all commingled together on the threshing floor, but the winnowing fork will sort it all out. Remember, John, John's talking about people here. This is about people. These images are about people. And within the people who are hearing him, there are those of genuine faith, and they are mingled together with those who are faking it who are faking it. There are people in his audience who are putting on an act. 
They look repentant. They look responsive. But they're wearing a mask. They're play acting. They're hypocrites, to use Jesus' language that he, will, he coined that term later in his ministry. Hypocrites, play acting, the mask wearers in the theater. And John says, Jesus can see through all the fakery, and he will sort it all out perfectly on the day of judgment. John is saying, John is saying, if you're living a fake double life, you will be found out. You will be destroyed. And Jesus will th see through all the facade of your life. John says, repent of all that hypocritical fakery. It's time to take off the mask. It's time to take off the mask. Now, the fourth life pattern that John calls us to turn away from is defiant indulgence. <laughs> defiant indulgence. Herod the Tetrarch, verse 19, who had been reproved by him for Her Herodias, his brother's wife, for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Herod and Herodias uh, caused a scandal <laughs> in the Jewish world. Uh, when they had an affair, both divorced their spouses in order to marry each other, but it was made worse by the fact that Herodias's ex was Herod's brother. So this is, <laughs> so Herod slept with his brother's wife while they were still married, divorced his own wife, wrecked his brother's marriage, and then married his brother's ex. This is like Jerry Springer level messed up, okay? <laughs> and John called him out. He said, he called him out for this defiant indulgence. It, Herod, listen, Herod figured the rules didn't apply to him. He thought he could do whatever he could get away with because he was in power, he was untouchable. And he even uses his power here to retaliate against John to imprison him and eventually behead him. And John rebukes Herod, and he, it serves as a warning that is still just as relevant today as it was back then. You guys read the news? You, you know powerful people flying on planes to islands to abuse and exploit their sex? Like, this is all still happening. And he's saying, just because you have power doesn't mean you get to use that power to exploit others, to indulge your sexual fantasies, to wreck the lives of marriage, lives and marriages and souls of innocent people in the process. I mean, this is terrible. Repent of all that defiant indulgence. It's time to turn from your sin. It's time to turn from your sin. Now, the core idea underneath all of these calls to repentance, whether from, religious, uh, or from cultural religiosity or dis disintegrated faith or hypocritical fakery or defiant indulgence, is this. Repentance is turning away from ourselves and turning instead toward God. Repentance is turning away from ourselves, what we think, what we want, what we think is best, and turning instead toward God. John says, won't you rethink your whole way of living? Won't you please stop your sinning? Admit you're in the wrong, turn around, get right with God, start treating others rightly. It's time to head in a whole new direction in life. And by the way, when you realize you're going the wrong way in life, the sooner you turn around, the better. That's the why, the what, and now the how, the how of repentance, quickly. In this passage, we see a parting of the ways, don't we? On the one hand, you have verse 10, the crowds coming to him and say, what should we do? You've got tax collectors and soldiers. What should we do? They feel the weight of conviction. Their hearts are softened. They're in humility. They're asking for help. And then on the other hand, you've got Herod. Verse 19a, the Herod, the Tetrarch, who reproved by him, he locked him up in prison. Locked John up in prison, verse 20. So Herod, you see, he doubled down. 
on his obstinacy and pride and willful rebellion, he shoots the messenger. He'd rather silence the prophet than search his own heart. And friends, whenever we hear the call of repentance, whenever we feel the weight of conviction, whenever our sin is exposed to the light, we are faced with a choice. Will we yield in tenderness and humility and contrition and sorrow to what God is calling out in our life, or will we become cold and hard and defiant and defensive and beastly? Will will we soften like the crowds, or will we harden like Herod? Friends, repentance means surrendering to the Lord and walking in faithful obedience before Him. Repentance means surrendering to the Lord and walking in faithful obedience before Him. It means humbling ourselves under His mighty hand that in due time He might lift us up. 1 Peter 5, 6. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. Now, friends, honestly, if we confess our souls here, if we, we can have an honest conversation... We got a little bit of Herod in us, don't we? More than we want to admit. We're a lot, we have a lot more pride and obstinacy and stubbornness and defensiveness than we, we'd like to admit. And we need help. And the friends, the only way we're going to surrender to the Lord and walk in faithfulness and obedience before Him is if Jesus changes our hearts. That's the only way it's going to happen. We need a new heart. We need a new spirit. We need a new birth, which is why we need someone better than John. We need Jesus. John prepared the way. Jesus is the way. John baptized with water. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. John cleansed the outside. Jesus cleans us on the inside. John warned of judgment. Jesus bore our judgment. Don't you see this, friends? That's why on the cross, Jesus took our fire. He felt the winnowing. He received the purging. He felt the scourging. He brought into his own soul the unquenchable unquenchable burnings. Why? Because he was dying in our place, and for our sake, he was taking all of our sin and shame upon himself, all of our cultural religiosity, all of our disintegrated faith, all of our hypocritical fakery, all of our defiant indulgence. He took it all upon himself and bore it forever into the grave. And then he rose again to clothe us in his perfect righteousness forever so that we might be born again and given a new heart and a new spirit that is eager to surrender to the Lord, to walk in faithful obedience before him each and every day of our lives. Friends, don't you see the salvation that Jesus wants to bring into our lives? It all begins with repentance. Friends, here's the takeaway. Repentance is good news if you and I will receive it. Repentance is good news if you and I will receive it. Prepare the way of the Lord. Do you bow your heads and pray with me? Oh, Father, help us to repent. Help us to lay down our pride to acknowledge your sin, to empty ourselves of all of our stubbornness and our willful self-denial and self-protection and defensiveness. Father, just blow through all of that. Help us see how desperate we are, how weak and helpless, how there is nothing we have to our name, all we need is in you. You're our only hope. And so, Father, we repent. We lay down everything so that we can have you and your all-sufficient grace for us through the cross and resurrection. You are our life, our only hope. So, Father, we want to turn. We want to rethink everything. We want to run into your arms. 
we want to come to the altar. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.